Mark, how are you doing? Charles, doing great. Excellent. So, Mark Rusinovich, everybody knows you, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Mark Rusinovich, I work in uh, Windows. I'm a technical fellow. Work on the Core OS and long-term architecture of Windows. Excellent. How are you doing? Good, Charles. Nice to see you, Dave nice. Solomon. Great to finally meet you. You always write really interesting things. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm uh, here in Redmond, teaching uh, Windows and Turtles class to a uh, Microsoft development group. Excellent. It's, uh, a strange feeling to come to Microsoft and tell Microsoft people how Windows works, but it's a privilege to, <laughs> to be invited to do that and also be able to see Mark. We had a nice dinner together Monday. Excellent. And, um, we have some exciting news. Absolutely. And can we show what that exciting news yes. is? It's actually concrete. Windows Internals, fifth edition. Nice. Finally hits the streets this week. So it started shipping yesterday. Yep. I mean, that is a thick book, which is why you have to actually come up here and teach us about it. In fact, how much this it's, is like? Uh, like 1,250 pages? 25% larger <laughs> than the fourth edition. So it's big, it's the largest uh, increase, I think, in any yeah. of the editions. Does that mean the kernel's so getting bigger? Um, the kernel is just always efficient. And, uh, yeah. it's and it just had more functionality. Yeah. Just Excellent. So, so we so wanted to try to track the you know, Vista memory footprint increase with the <laughs> size of the book increase. <laughs> but you know, we're, the next edition, we're going to start working on it right now. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we fit in the same spine. So we, we're going to add more content. We're going to take out words. Wow. Uh, so that we can fit the new material in without, uh, with, and be able to use the same hardware, basically. Right. Just like Windows 7. Yeah. In fact, Absolutely. This uh, update is the Vista 2008 update, but we've already planned the changes for Windows 7. We expect that to be out much sooner than uh, this was after Server 2008. Um, the reason I think for somebody that hasn't, that's still with XP, that's looking at Windows 7, mm -hmm. although this book is not uh, updated for Win 7, it's covering all the core kernel changes that were introduced in Vista that carried forward into Windows 7. And the level of change from Vista to Windows 7 is obviously much less. So sure. somebody's trying to get a jump on Windows 7, this is going to cover key technology. Basically, Windows 7 is almost entirely additive. So there's, mm. in the new book, there'll be new material that's not Excellent. in Vista, but everything that's in Vista is basically in Win7. Absolutely. There's a new name on the book cover. Yeah. Alex Ionescu down here. All right. Well, what's what's his story? Well, Alex, when Mark came to Microsoft, when he was uh, stolen by you guys. We didn't uh, steal him. Yeah. Well, I told him it was his destiny all along. <laughs> uh, he wasn't able to teach Windows internal classes with me, so I needed to find somebody to help. So he's mini Mark. Interesting. He's the Mark replacement. Uh, he's not as tall, though. No. And, uh, Anyway, Alex has been teaching the class with me, and Mark and I decided to engage him to help us uh, do the update. So he did quite a bit of work on this. So let's talk about a few of the key things uh, that are in the book, that are new in Vista. I mean, we've, we've, we've talked to Mark before about Windows 7. Probably the most popular interview in Channel 9's history. He went through the uh, kind of until a long list way. Until, until this one, because now we have David Solomon on camera. You know, a lot of people have read your stuff and may not have met you. They, you do teach a lot. And they love your tools, too. Yeah, I love getting credit for the system internals tools even though I've contributed to none of them, uh, other than suggestions and bug reports. So as an outsider, who's not really an outsider, but you are, you don't work for us, take us through some of the key things that, are, you know, that you're really interested in or the things that stand out the most to you. Uh, because I love the memory manager the most, Superfetch mm. is really super. Mm. The whole technologies around Superfetch introduced in Vista that carry forward into Windows 7. That was a real state-of-the-art advance in, in memory management technology. So the whole goal of Superfetch is to keep RAM full of the things that you're using the most. And it smooths, it smooths out the, the usage patterns of the system because prior to the introduction of Superfetch, um, accessing some large set of files that you don't regularly access basically causes what's cached to be replaced with stuff that you're not going to use again. What Superfetch is doing is putting back into RAM the things that you're using the most based on page access histories that it's accumulated in a, in a Windows service. So that's very, very cool. And it also prioritizes memory. So it, based on the access patterns that it observes, it will give higher priority to memory that it sees frequently accessed, or the data puts them in higher priority pages, which means that they age out uh, after the lower priority pages do to try to keep them in RAM longer. So prior to uh, introduction to Superfetch, the memory manager's basic page cache was a single first in, first out list. Now there's eight prioritized lists. So an app that's chewing through reading data in and putting it back in the cache is going to keep recycling 
the low priority pages and hopefully not have to reach into repurpose uh, cache data that is something that you're referencing more frequently. Yeah, and speaking about priorities, uh, there's uh, besides the memory prioritization yeah. that was introduced in Vista, there's also I.O. priorities that were introduced in Vista and actually are used by Superfetch. Superfetch, because it's uh, being predictive, it doesn't want to interfere with what you're doing in the foreground and so it, in the background, will fetch the stuff in but it wants to do it at low priority, basically let your foreground activity, like if you're reading Outlook and it needs to do disk I.O., that should take precedence over Superfetch proactively reading in something that you may or may not actually need. And so it will issue those IOs that it's performing at low priority so that they go to the end of the list. Basically, there's a list of IOs waiting to go down the storage stack. They go to the end of the list. That good thing for IO priority is because Vista is constantly beating on your disk. It's yes, good for it you. We want it. Content indexing is another yeah. example. So IO priorities make that sort of But they fix that in Windows 7. It all works great. Actually, SP1. SP1. Yeah. Okay, sorry, SP2. So let's keep on going. I mean, what about uh, one of the things we haven't discussed very much is uh, dynamic system address space. What does that mean? What's going on here? So on the 32 bit system, um, there were some decisions made back in you know, 1990 when the NT kernel was being designed that took the 2 gigabyte address space, which at that time was a massive amount of virtual memory. I mean, 1990 to think of using 2 gigs of virtual memory. Um, and it was divided in basically a set of uh, partitions or segments and the various components that the OS stores in kernel address space, code, data, file system cache, had some upper limits based on these artificial sort of lines in the sand. Um, Landy Wang, incredibly bright. Uh, He's memory man master. Developer yeah. in the Windows team, distinguished engineer, went and basically redid all that work so that all of the components in system space can grow without any artificial limitations. The sum total still has to fit in the size of the address space, which is by default two gigs. So that means big scalability improvements on uh, terminal servers, for example, or server systems. Uh, or specialized client systems. Again, this shows Microsoft still cares about 30 bits. Yeah, it does. I mean, it seems like <clears throat> we keep talking about 64 bit, 64 bit. I'm running 64 bit Windows 7 right now, but um, not all applications have been written to take advantage of it. I mean, Office comes to mind. I use 64 bit, but mm -hmm. you can write really large memos in Notepad. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep on, let's keep on going here. What I mean. Uh, so speaking of Landy, yeah. there's another uh, change that he made in uh, Vista which uh, helps prevent malware from infecting the systems. Uh, mm -hmm. In XPSP2, where there was a big security push, yes. we introduced DEP, or Data Execution Prevention, which is marking pages of memory that shouldn't ever execute code, shouldn't ever have code that should be executed as, as non-executable. Mm -hmm. And that was made possible with advances in processor technology by Intel and AMD at the time. And what that means is uh, malware that's trying to exploit a buffer overflow and, and put executable code on the heap or the stack will fail to execute that code if it's marked no execute. One of the uh, holes in that in no execute is that uh, malware that figures out how to call a function in the kernel can actually execute code uh, just by passing parameters and maybe the address of the function that they want to call. Mm. So they're never actually having to execute data, they're actually executing code. and. So a way to prevent them from figuring out where those functions are that they can call, ASLR, or address space load randomization, will go and every time the system boots, load system DLLs at different locations in memory, and then following that, application DLLs that are marked as ASLR compatible will load at random places as well. So they can't find functions like the, the kernel function to turn off ASL, uh, DEP, for example, yeah. or to drop a file on the disk. Interesting. In fact, really, there's a lot of pretty fundamental security improvements. ASLR is one. Um, the infrastructure for user account control, fundamental extension of the Windows security model, introducing mandatory integrity controls. On top of the discretionary uh -huh. access controls that were there from the start. Excellent. Um, BitLocker. Uh, yeah, BitLocker was a big thing. One of the big uh, IT Pro features, favorite features in Vista is BitLocker, the ability yeah. to encrypt the volume. So, you know, one of the common problems of laptops getting stolen is somebody has access potentially to sensitive corporate data. Mm. But with BitLocker, the entire volume is encrypted, so they, if they boot the system, unless they've got a PIN or a smart card, if it's protected that way, they can't gain access to the data. 
they can't install an alternate OS or take the disk out and put in another machine because it's locked to uh, the uh, trusted platform module.